I'm Brittany Harden Tangway, a manager with KPMG, and I am fascinated by the practice of transfer pricing and its impact on the global market. Join me each episode as I explore the transfer pricing world with specialists who will explain the ins and outs of this niche practice where tax meets economics. We're going to talk about transfer pricing for financial transactions. We did an earlier episode where we talked about transfer pricing in the financial services industry, but this is different. So I've got with me today, Bob Clare, Managing Director with Washington National Tax. Hello, everybody. As well as Shantini Ghosh, Principal in Washington National Tax. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Brittany. Financial services are not financial transactions. You can see financial transactions in any industry. Would you explain what financial transactions are and why they're not limited to financial services? Financial transactions are largely loans more than anything else, but they can also be other things such as guarantees, and that might be a guarantee of someone else's loan or a guarantee of performance. We tend to get the two financial transactions and financial services confused. Financial services often have firms that make loans as a business, like commercial banks, for example. But what we're really talking about are loans that fund a multinational company, regardless of what they make. Everybody has a certain amount of debt, generally speaking. And when it's at a subsidiary of a multinational, nine times out of 10, it's going to be an intercompany loan. And it's a significant part of their P&L. I know with transfer pricing of goods and services, we tend to always stay focused on the operating income. Because most of the methods that we use for the analysis we do look at the operating income or higher up in the income statement. But if you jump from operating income down to the earnings before tax, the single biggest item you'll see there is probably the interest expense. And that's why financial transactions can be quite important because they're a big deduction people take before they get down to the earnings before tax line. And it's easy for us to think about taking a loan out from a bank, but when you're thinking about related companies, they're related. They can borrow from one another. And that creates a financial transaction between related parties. Is that right? That's right. Think about everybody borrows. And how many of us at some point in our life have, say, borrowed from our parents to pay for school or to get started in life, maybe a first car or a first home? Those are technically related party loans and should be priced at market rates. So just take it up a scale and say, oh, it's multinational corporation with a subsidiary opening up in a new country How are you going to fund that balance sheet? Part of that is going to be equity because it's a subsidiary, but a big part of it might be debt. (laughs) I joke that I started this podcast so that my mom can understand what I do. Hopefully she won't listen to this one and I don't have to pay her back for my first car. (laughs) There's going to be an arm's length interest rate on that loan, Brittany. (laughs) That's what I'm afraid of. (laughs) I think Bob summarized it very well. Loans are the primary transaction in addition to guarantees, cash pooling, multinational companies have the advantage of moving cash among their entities so that if somebody has extra cash, that can be used for short-term funding in jurisdictions where there's not enough cash. They can do that through a physical or a notional cash pooling. They can sell their receivables to each other which is another way of providing short-term funding through factoring transactions. These are all the different types of financial transactions, but intercompany loans definitely are the most dominant ones. So how do we test these transactions? Intercompany loans are one of the transactions where comparable uncontrolled transactions, comparable uncontrolled price, cut, cup, are most prevalent. This is an area where we see a regular use of cuts and every transaction, when we look at it, we have to look into the details of what's the risk associated with that lending? What is the risk that I will never get my money back? How long am I giving the money for? So there are many aspects that we need to consider for pricing intercompany loan. But the most important thing to understand is a loan between two different legal entities, which may look very similar, the analysis could be very different. So each transaction has to have its customized analysis. Companies borrow from banks or they borrow from investors by issuing bonds, creating a plethora of observations that we can directly observe what was the rate on that loan when it was with unrelated parties. Now, 
The interesting aspect of it is you need to figure out everything that affects the pricing of a loan. And Shiny Anthony was talking about, you know, am I going to get my money back? How risky is that? Or will I get all of my money back or maybe only 70 cents on the dollar, let's say, if somebody goes into a bankruptcy? Let's think about it from the same perspective of if you were thinking about buying a house and going for a mortgage. And some of the questions your mortgage broker is going to ask you is, well, do you want a 15-year loan or a 30-year loan? Because that's going to affect the price. Do you want a fixed rate on that mortgage or a floating rate on that mortgage? Because floating rate, it could go up, could go down, but the fixed rate, you've got the certainty that you know what the rate will be for the life of the mortgage. And of course, what country are you in? What currency are you borrowing in? And with mortgages, we're pretty used to the concept of you can repay your mortgage early if you want without any penalty. Mm -hmm. But in the corporate transactions, there's often terms, prepayment penalties. We have to take that into account. Just like when we see loans where someone said, I'm going to borrow for seven years, but I want the option to extend it out to nine if I need it. Well, that's an option that the borrower is going to have to pay for because the lender's at risk that you might exercise the option. All right. To summarize, when performing these analyses, we're looking at the actual price of the intercompany transaction, which is essentially the payment for being able to borrow, as opposed to maybe comparing the profitability, which is what we might do in a more typical, like tangible goods or services transaction. By looking at that pricing using the cut method or the cut method, you have a number of different comparable agreements that you could potentially compare to to determine what an arm's length price would be for that arrangement. That's right. So actually capturing that in these intercompany agreements seems to be critical, especially in these types of arrangements. The agreements are critical. You want them to be very well specified. If you don't have an agreement, which does happen on occasion, you say, well, I advance that money to my intent. I said, well, what's, what, give me the notes so I can see the details of it. And they don't have it. I just, it's a panic mode because now you have to try to figure out, well, what was the intention of the two parties at the time this money was advanced? Was it actually debt? Could it possibly? Mm -hmm be seen that, well, no, it was really equity. Did you think about when it would be repaid? All these sort of terms that would come into play. Most of the terms that you need to know for comparability searching, right, for saying, I've got to go find something that's really comparable to this, are specified in a good loan note. It's going to tell you the maturity date and the repayment schedule and the currency that you're borrowing in. And if it's a really good loan note, it's even going to say, what's the penalty if you're in default and you don't make your payment on time? And what rights does the lender get in those cases? And specify the prepayment options and all these others. But the one thing it doesn't specify is the one thing that Shai Anthony brought up first, which was saying, what's the probability I'm not going to get repaid or repaid in full? And that's the credit risk of the borrower. And that's one of the things that makes working in this area challenging because you have to come up with the credit riskiness? What's the probability that there would be a default for a borrower? Now, in the world of unrelated parties and lending, a lot of these instruments are rated by public agencies. And you can go to Moody's or Standard & Poor's or Fitch and say, well, what's the rating on that instrument? That will tell me how risky it is. But in the world of related party lending, the entity who's the borrower almost never has a public rating. And therefore, you've got to come up with how risky is that borrower, because that's going to be important to how much risk premium there would be in the interest rate that you're charging. Right. And that's where, Bob, the main challenge comes, because we can come up with quantitative models, Brittany, which will look at the financials. What has it been looking like for the last couple of years? How do the projections look and fit it into a model and get a credit rating? But then the next question is, when somebody is lending money to you, do they really look at you completely as a standalone fiction mm -hmm. or do they think that there's some benefit to be associated with a broader group? And mm -hmm. that's where the question comes on, do we look at a standalone credit rating of the borrowing entity or do we consider an adjustment to that rating based on its relationship with the parent? It's like, is it such a critical entity that the parent would never let it go down? So even if the standalone credit rating looks weak, in reality, it's pretty safe to lend money to that entity because the parent will make sure it's always liquid. So that's where a lot of jurisdictions are very clear on what they expect to see in a transfer pricing analysis. And in certain other jurisdictions, 
it's not so clear. So when we are doing a transfer pricing analysis, it's always we have to look at two sides, right? The borrower's jurisdiction and the lender's jurisdiction. And so at times there's a tension if one purely wants a standalone rating versus when we know somebody else really wants to look at the rating based on parent affiliation. So it's always walking a very fine line to balance our analysis to make sure that both tax authorities are sufficiently happy with what we give. To use an analogy, let's say an individual has a fairly low credit rating and this is just a person trying to take out a loan, but then you find out she's from a famously wealthy family. And so then all of a sudden, the importance of the credit worthiness of the borrower as an individual entity standing alone, they may not look like they can assume a certain level of risk. However, you can't ignore the affiliation, but that's where the terms are so important in that intercompany agreement because it can help spell out the rest of it for you to get a clearer understanding. Exactly. Well, it's interesting you raise it that way because if there is an explicit term in the contract that says, oh, and your parent is going to back up this loan, mm. you've got one set of facts that you can say, oh, okay, not only do I have a loan now, but now I have an intercompany guarantee. Right. And that can happen either with a, say, a third party lending to a subsidiary where the parent will issue a note or a a statement to the lender to say, yes, that's my sub and I'm going to make sure they pay that debt back. And then from the banker's perspective, in that case, they would look at it and say, well, I don't have to judge the sub's risk. I have to judge your risk. That's my risk, really. And you may be publicly rated. That makes the world easy. But what's interesting in transfer pricing that's come about in the last decade or so has been the concept of what if there is no explicit guarantee, but there's an implicit presumption of some degree of parental support. And this came up in the most important was in the General Electric Capital Canada court Mm -hmm. case. And it's been codified now in the OECD guidelines, the new chapter 10 on financial transactions, which takes the position of, yes, the court case decision was correct, and you should consider whether, even without an explicit guarantee, a rational lender would assume that there is some degree of implicit support. And as Shianti has pointed out, it would depend a lot upon the nature of that particular subsidiary to the overall business. You could have a subsidiary that one might judge is just absolutely core to the business. In which case you say, well, they can't let it fail. It would bring the whole business down. Or you could have a subsidiary who's doing something that's, say, in a marginal area of the business there. Maybe they aren't going to write a check to bail that entity out in the event that it gets into financial troubles. Yeah, it is interesting to think about it from a familial standpoint, right? Here's the the black sheep son. The family stands to support because they feel responsible to, but the same terms probably not be expected from the next in line to run the family business. And we usually start off with by what we think their rating would be if they were to issue debt. It could be that their standalone rating is actually limited by the parent because people would say, well, you can't get scored better than your parent because the parent could do a dividend pay up and make you less secure. So there are all these issues that we take into account. There are a lot of moving parts, I think, probably more moving parts in a financial transaction than in many others that we have to deal with. And taking into account the implicit support, maybe taking into account whether it's actually secured by something, taking into account maybe it's a subordinated debt, that your claim as the lender in this case means you have to line up after other lenders. All of these things are going to affect what the arm's length interest rate would be on that instrument. A lot of moving parts indeed. There is so much more to talk about on this subject. I hope you will all join me again so we can get deeper into this. In in the meantime, thanks again for joining me and offering your brilliance. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having us, Brittany. Thanks for joining me on this adventure in transfer pricing. See you next time.